You're very welcome back. Now, today, the 16th of June, marks Bloomsday, the date depicted in James Joyce's novel Ulysses as named after the central character, Leopold Bloom. Between 3 and 6 today, the long-standing tradition of songs, readings and performances from Ulysses will take place at Wolf Tone Square in Dublin. A supporter of Bloomsday, Senator David Norris, will be there but we have them first. Good morning, we Senator. Do. Absolutely. How lovely to see you, Simon <clears throat> and Ella. Thank you, Senator David Norris. You, you've weekend. managed to squeeze us into yeah, your very yeah, busy yeah. day. Yes, yes. So thank you for doing that. It is a huge weekend. What does what today hold for you? Well, I started off with a breakfast in the James Joyce Centre, and last night, <clears throat> uh, lovely Anne Doyle did a public interview with me in Belvedere, which was great fun. So I told all my stories and did little bits of Finnegan's Wake because mm. this is not only Bloomsday, but this year is the 80th anniversary of the publication of Finnegan's Wake in 1939. Really? Yes. And was the breakfast specific to the book? Uh, well, not entirely, because there were rashers and eggs and, and <coughs> black and white pudding, but there were also nice slices of kidney which gives yes. to the palate a fine tang of faintly scented georan, according oh, to Blue. What? Wow. It, <laughs> Where do I sign up? Good There's morning. a map of the book that gives an hour of the day, a colour, an organ of the body, and uh, all this kind of stuff, Homeric references and so on. And the first three have no organ of the body. You know, they're intellectually beautiful, but they're kind of deracinated. And then you open chapter four. Mr. Leopold Bloom ate with relish the inner organs of beasts and fowls, and you're right into the frying pan, and he has a lovely conversation with his cat. The cat says to him, meow, <laughs> M-K-G-N-A-O, <laughs> and then Bloom says, milk for the pussins, and the cat is thrilled and says back to him, meow. <laughs> You know, there's a purr put in, two R's. It's absolutely lovely. So for anyone who hasn't read Ulysses, <clears throat> and I know, Senator, you're going to say everyone should have read it at this stage, no. but the central character is, of course, Leop Leopold Bloom. Yes. Tell us, who was he? Leopold Bloom was somebody imagined by James Joyce. He was um, a middle-class <clears throat> Dublin advertising canvasser. Uh, but he is, uh, Joyce regarded him as l'homme moyen sensuel, the average sensual man, and, and so he is. But he's endlessly curious about everything, uh, and that gives him a delight. He's also a really humane person. I mean, in the Cyclops episode, he said, but sure, that's not what life is about, insult, injury, hatred. Doesn't everybody know life is about the opposite of that? And they say, what? He said, uh, love, excuse me, I have to go. You know, so he's not like Superman. He doesn't sort of burst out of his underpants and smack the uh, citizen in the kisser with his fist. But he, he, and he says later, a bite from a sheep is more aggravating, you know? They weren't expecting a bite from a sheep like him. It's, so he's a lovely character. It's not an easy read, though, is it? A co in terms of reading it cold. My brother, who studied in UCD, you know, took Ulysses and became a student of Ulysses yes. and waxes lyrical about it, much like you do. And when he reads it or you read it to me, it brings it to life. But totally. to read it cold... Yeah. <sighs> well, you're absolutely right. It's a you have of... to listen <clears throat> you have to yeah. the text. I mean, there's one episode, Proteus, in which uh, the young Stephen Dedalus is uh, puzzling his head as he walks along the Strand about the perennial problem of the artist, how to give form, fixity, shape, definition, to human life, which is of its nature always in chaos. And he rifles the whole history of academic philosophy in Europe, and uh, he has these metaphysical weapons. But he also has two physical, simple weapons, a stump of pencil and a scrap of paper from the library. Yeah. And then you come across this, <clears throat> listen, a four-worded wave speech, S-double-E-S-double-O-H-R-double-S-E-I-S-S-S-O-O-O-O-S. What the hell is that? Is it a printing mistake? No, you have to listen to it. Mm. Listen, a four-worded wave speech. And it's exactly the sound of a wave if you try it. You know, but a lot of people, they're intimidated and yes. they don't try. And wasn't there a problem in terms of the book being published that the editor did come back and say, hang on, is that right? <laughs> uh, is that it's spelled right? Where, yeah, where there were a few this? things like that. The yeah. printer was a man called Darantier, <clears throat> and um, he thought he knew more than Joyce. Yeah. And, for example, there's a list of famous people, 
and there's Michelangelo Hayes, and he said, oh, no, that's wrong. It must be Michelangelo, and then somebody called Hayes. So he put a comma between the Michelangelo yeah. and the Hayes. But Michelangelo Hayes was a well-known Dublin character mm. who was the founder of the Dublin Photographic Club. So the printer made a mistake. It's yeah. incredible. It's incredible, it? yeah, it's fascinating. The, the it's a mistake is... to think you know more than Joyce. Well, that, that's for sure. The book is and was groundbreaking. It's and awful. still to this day is held as one of the greatest pieces of literature. It is, yes. Why does it stand the, the test of time? Is it because it's timeless? Oh, yes, it is timeless, even though it is very securely located in Edwardian time. And specific, mm. And that's yeah. one of the joys, that uh, people like to dress up. <clears throat> yeah. And in order to do that, they have to nibble at the edges of the book. And it's very infectious, you know, you start reading it, and then you hop along to another section of the book, um, but not everybody has to read it, the whole thing. Cover to cover. You, you know? can dip in and out And I don't it. think people should be forced to read anything, you know. Yeah. I mean, I but discovered Joyce for myself. It the joy out of it, doesn't it? Exactly. Yeah. I, I discovered Joyce for myself. I, mm. When I started off when I was very small, when I was eight, uh, I, my, I had a very glamorous uncle. This is one of his rings. And uh, he used to wear aftershave, which is almost a criminal <laughs> offence in the 1950s. <laughs> and he had a travelling library with him and there was Dubliners in it. So I took two of his cigars and the Dubliners and retreated up a tree in the garden. And it seemed to me that James Joyce hadn't an idea how to tell a story. <laughs> you know, because I was used to things like Maupassant, the diamond necklace. A woman borrows a necklace, the necklace is lost, she ruins herself replacing it, and then she meets the woman she borrowed from and it turns out the necklace, it was only paste. <laughs> Smack in the face, end of story. The first story in Dubliners ends with the querulous voice of an old woman saying, so then, of course, when they seen that, they realised something had gone wrong with them. Dot, dot, dot. There isn't even a bloody full stop. Yeah, yeah. it's you know, kind of breaking all the rules yeah, almost. Yeah, but Joyce is bringing you back in to become part of the text and to help to resolve the thing of what was wrong with Father Flynn. Mm. And it's interesting, that book is written in a style of scrupulous meanness. It's very narrow range, very grey kind of, of, of language. Does it bring you joy, David, that Bloomsday has become the event that it has? Oh, I think it's wonderful. I mean, the first Bloomsday was celebrated in 1954 <clears throat> by Tony Crone and Paddy Kavner uh, and uh, Miles Nogopoulin. And they got gloriously drunk on that occasion, I can tell you. <laughs> uh, but uh, there was a gap then of about 10 years, and then I started up, and I started performing pieces in the locations in Dublin where they actually took yeah. place, because yes. I thought there was a special magic about that. And I invented a uniform uh, of a straw boater, uh, this striped tie, striped tie. Uh, brocade waistcoat, white jacket, white trousers, plimsolls, dark glasses, and a walking cane. It appears nowhere in Ulysses. It was concocted by me uh, out of uh, the description of Blaze's Boylan in Ulysses, and a photograph of Joyce in southern England in the 1920s. But it's gone all over the world. Yeah, it's it's my Versace statement. <laughs> I've influenced Bloomsday I'm not fashion. sure you're getting enough credit for it's that, It's your Senator. contribution. Oh, I don't mind at all. It's oh, just it's rather amusing. Yes. Um, as well as Bloomsday going on, of course, we're in the middle of Pride Month. Absolutely. How do you feel about that? I mean, it, I, I was saying to you earlier on, it wasn't a month before, it no. was a week. And as you very uh, interestingly pointed out, it didn't exist not so long ago. And of course it yeah, didn't. It didn't. So we've made such an incredible headway, haven't we? Yeah, I, I was on the first March. And when there were seven of us, 1973. Wow. Seven of you. Seven of us. And um, we marched in single file up... Um, uh, Grafton Street, and we picketed the Department of Justice, and we had placards. I had a placard that said, "Homosexuals are revolting," which was a doublon ton. Oh, brilliant! And the 46A bus nearly went through <laughs> the railings of the Green when the right, right, driver saw it. <laughs> and if you'll excuse a little bit of bad language, there was um, a uh, lorry drew up, and the minister's carpet was fired out onto the pavement. The secretaries were all out with their eyes out and stalks on the first of floor. Of course. Looking out. And the, the helper got out and he took one look at us and he said, back into the cab, Jesus, make fucking queers. And uh, Mick lumbered out and he took one look at us and said, what a beer? Well, I don't give a bollocks. I'll pick it, I'll fucking pick it, mate. And he took up my placard and he walked around with us for half an hour, oh, leaving the minister's carpet on dear the floor. Lord. It was a wonderful example of uh, working class <clears throat> solidarity. 
It's terrific. It's always a joy to have you in here. <laughs> it really, really is. Much, Thank you, have you have so much day. for giving us your time. Have a busy day, yes. yes yeah. Enjoy every moment of, of it. I will. Thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. And we will apologise for anyone who's offended by that <laughs> colourful language. He's uh, always colourful when you visit us, Senator. Thank you.